and welcome to this month's release of Videotech. This session, we'll be taking a look at the Eagle Premier and Dodge Monaco instrument cluster. We'll first look at the components of the instrument cluster and discuss how they work. Next, we'll examine the availability of some of the service parts of the instrument cluster. Then we'll do a sample problem that includes the complete disassembly and assembly of the instrument cluster. We'll end this session with a look at the procedure for the replacement of the flexible printed circuit board and a look at the proper way to reconnect the ignition off draw, or IOD, so that it won't cause a clock readout problem. So let's get started. The standard analog instrument cluster for the 1990 Eagle Premier and Dodge Monaco consists of a speedometer with odometer and resettable trip odometer, tachometer, fuel level gauge with low fuel warning light, coolant temperature gauge, engine oil pressure gauge, and a clock. The vehicle maintenance monitor and trip computer are optional equipment. Voltage is applied to all of these gauges when the ignition switch is in the run or start position through fuses 10 and 15. The speedometer is electronically driven, thereby eliminating the chance of drive cable problems and assuring a steady, reliable reading. The speedometer is operated by an electronic circuit. A vehicle speed sensor located on the transaxle sends a signal to a speed sensor module. Now this signal is an input at pin terminals four and seven of the speed sensor module. The speed sensor module is located in the instrument cluster and produces a signal whose frequency is proportional to the vehicle's speed. This signal is then filtered, amplified, and shaped into a clean square wave signal, which is then sent to the speedometer through the flexible printed circuit board located on the back of the instrument cluster. Now these signals from the speed sensor and speed sensor module are only readable with an oscilloscope. The speedometer is then activated by the frequency generated by the speed sensor module. Now the square wave signal generated by the speed sensor module is also an input for the vehicle maintenance monitor, engine control unit or ECU, trip computer, passive restraint module, speed control module, and the daytime running lights that are required on Canadian vehicles only. And with the engine running, the solid state tachometer receives the engine speed signal from the ignition control module and displays the engine RPM. The fuel, oil pressure, and temperature gauges are all magnetic coil type and operate similarly. Now, each gauge consists of two coils and an armature to which a needle is attached. The current flowing through the coils of the gauge creates two opposing magnetic fields that control the position of the needle. One path goes through the lower coil and to ground. The other flows through the upper coil and to the respective sending unit and to ground. Now, all three of these senders are variable resistors. The current through the coils varies as the resistance changes, varying the magnetic fields that control the needle position. Now, a low fuel indicator that lights when the fuel tank is almost empty is also part of the fuel gauge circuit. It's controlled by a low fuel circuit board mounted directly behind the fuel gauge inside the instrument cluster. The warning indicators also receive battery voltage from fuses 10 and 15 with the ignition switch in the accessories or run positions. All warning indicators are activated by a ground signal. Some of the serviceable parts for this instrument cluster are the vehicle maintenance monitor, the trip computer, the clock, and their respective switches, depending on how the vehicle is equipped. Now, all the lamps, the flexible printed circuit board, and the speed sensor module are also serviceable. The lamps on the vehicle maintenance monitor, trip computer, and clock are all recessed into the components and can be removed or installed with needle-nosed pliers. The low fuel indicator circuit board, speedometer, and tachometer may be replaced separately from the dial and gauge assembly. Should the fuel, oil pressure, or temperature gauge need replacement, the whole dial and gauge assembly will have to be replaced. 
because they've been previously calibrated by the manufacturer. Now that we know how the gauges work and what some of the serviceable parts are, let's look at an actual problem. Here we have a customer complaint of a temperature gauge not operating. Now to diagnose this problem, we'll need a sound diagnostic approach, like the six step troubleshooting procedure. The six troubleshooting steps are, step one, verify the customer complaint. Step two, check for related symptoms. Step three, analyze the symptoms. Step four, isolate the problem. Step five, repair the problem. And step six, verify proper operation. Starting with step one, verifying the customer's complaint. After allowing the engine to attain its normal operating temperature, we verify that the temperature gauge has not moved. Checking for related symptoms is the second step of the troubleshooting procedure. In our case, we see that the tachometer, fuel, and oil pressure gauges, and the warning lights are all working. Remember, we said that all gauges and warning lights receive their battery voltage from fuses 10 and 15. So we know that this instrument cluster is receiving battery voltage. This leads us right into step three of the troubleshooting procedure, analyzing the symptoms. We'll start by checking the engine temperature sender. The engine temperature sender is located in the rear of the engine. To check the sender with the ignition in the run position, disconnect the connector. The gauge needle should drop to the cold position in this case, the needle still shows no movement. Next, momentarily touch terminal two of the engine temperature sender to ground. The gauge should go to full hot. Again, the gauge does not register, so we know the sender is not at fault. Eliminating the temperature sender is a possible fault. Now we'll have to check for continuity in the circuit between the temperature sender and the instrument cluster. In order to make this check, first we'll have to remove the instrument cluster from the instrument panel so that we'll be able to access the instrument cluster connectors. Before removing the instrument cluster, to prevent shorts, disconnect the negative battery cable. When removing the instrument cluster on 1988 and 1989 premieres, you must first disconnect the shift indicator cable from the shift lever pulley located at the base of the steering column. To disconnect the cable, remove the three screws holding the instrument panel knee bolster. Next, loosen the screw holding the shift indicator anchor bracket in place and remove the cable and bracket by sliding the bracket off the screw. Then remove the wire from the rear of the shift lever pulley. Again, the above steps only apply to 1988 and 1989 Eagle Premier models. The rest of this procedure is the same for all models. Now remove the instrument cluster bezel by removing the three screws at the top of the bezel. Carefully pull the instrument cluster bezel out from the four retaining clips. When removing the bezel, hold the lower panel away from the cluster so the tabs on the lower panel do not contact the cluster. Place a clean towel over the steering column to protect the instrument cluster lens from being scratched. Then remove the four instrument cluster retaining screws and tilt the cluster forward. Next, carefully disconnect the electrical connectors by pulling them straight off. The natural tendency to wiggle them back and forth will easily damage the fragile terminals on the vehicle maintenance monitor, trip computer, and clock. Remove the cluster from the vehicle and set it aside. All gauges contain a silicone fluid that slows the movement of the gauge. So whenever setting a cluster or gauge down, always set them down with the dial facing up. This will prevent the dampening fluid from leaking out. Again, this procedure is used whenever access to the instrument cluster connectors is required. With the instrument cluster out, we can now continue to check for continuity from the temperature sender connector to the instrument cluster. With an ohm meter, check for continuity between the temperature sender connector and cavity 12 of the cluster connector. In this case, the ohm meter shows continuity.
If in your diagnosis all the wire circuits check out okay, the next step is to visually inspect the flexible printed circuit for cracks or poor contacts. This flex circuit is in good condition. Later in this session, we'll cover the procedure for the replacement of a damaged flexible printed circuit. We've now isolated the problem to the temperature gauge. This is the fourth step of the troubleshooting procedure. Because the gauges are not available separately and are calibrated by the manufacturer, the whole dial and gauge assembly will have to be replaced. This requires a complete disassembly of the instrument cluster. Before you begin with step five, repairing the problem, be sure that your work area is clean and free of oil and grease. Also, you want to be sure you have some way of keeping track of the different size screws. Begin by removing the six screws from the front lower mask assembly and then turn the cluster over. Remove this one screw located below and to the right of the speedometer. Disconnect the switch wire harnesses from the maintenance monitor and trip computer. Special care must be taken when removing the wire harness from the cluster. The wires may have to be guided out of their retainers one at a time. Remove the maintenance monitor by removing two attaching screws. Do the same with the trip computer. Now you can remove the control switch panel while carefully guiding the left side harness through. Then remove the English metric button and spring. Remove the 11 screws holding the clear lens to the cluster and remove the lens. Then remove the black mask. Next, turn over the cluster carefully and remove the connector and two screws from the tachometer. And remove the four screws behind the speedometer. Lift the protective covering to access these three screws and remove them. Then remove the seven nuts off the gauge terminals. You should wear clean gloves while handling the dial and gauge assembly. Fingerprints and fingernails will mar the surface. Any attempt to clean this surface with solvents or cleaners may damage the dial. Finally, remove the dial and gauge assembly from the cluster housing. If our problem were a low fuel indicator lamp not working because of a low fuel circuit board, we would replace it at this time by removing this nut and pulling the circuit board out and replacing it with a new one. In our case, we're replacing the coolant temperature gauge and as a result, the dial and gauge assembly. Because of this, we'll also have to remove the four terminals located behind the gauges and set them aside. We'll need these terminals on our new dial and gauge assembly. The speed sensor module is located here. Should it ever become necessary to remove it, you can do so by removing these two screws. To remove the speedometer from the dial and gauge assembly, grasp the pointer hub and slowly rotate the pointer assembly clockwise and counterclockwise until the pointer gently contacts the trip reset shaft while gently pulling upward on the hub. Repeat this procedure until the pointer assembly lifts off the movement shaft. Set the pointer aside. You'll have to reinstall it later on. Remove the pointer from the tachometer by rotating the pointer and pulling up on it. Set it aside. Turn the dial and gauge assembly over and remove the two screws holding the tachometer and the two screws holding the speedometer. Remove both the tachometer and the speedometer and set them aside. To reinstall the speedometer and tachometer, first, Carefully remove the new dial and gauge assembly from its box. Position the tachometer on the new assembly and secure it with two screws. Align the pointer tip to indicate approximately 6,000 RPM. Grasp the pointer by the hub and gently push the bushing on the movement shaft. Rotate the pointer assembly counterclockwise while gently pushing down on the hub toward the dial surface. A slight resistance should be felt. When you release the pointer, the pointer tip should align with the zero horizontal graduation. If the pointer is not properly aligned with the horizontal graduation, perform either of the two following steps. If the pointer is too high, 
Continue rotating the pointer counterclockwise until alignment is achieved. If it's too low, rotate the pointer assembly clockwise until rotation resistance is felt. Continue rotating clockwise to compensate for the initial misalignment. Release the hub, allowing the pointer assembly to rotate back to its rest position. If alignment is not achieved, repeat the procedure. The installation of the speedometer is similar to that of the tachometer. First, position the speedometer and secure it with two screws. Align the pointer tip with a 90 mile per hour mark. Grasp the pointer by the hub and gently push the bushing on the movement shaft using the same alignment procedure as for the tachometer. If the pointer is not properly aligned to the horizontal graduation, perform the same adjustment procedure used on the tachometer. After installing the speedometer and tachometer on the new dial and gauge assembly, reverse the removal procedure to install the dial and gauge assembly into the cluster housing. Then install the cluster housing into the vehicle, making sure that all the screws are returned to their original positions. This completes step five of the troubleshooting procedure, repairing the trouble. Step six of the troubleshooting procedure is to verify proper operation. This is done by reconnecting the battery and starting the car up. With the engine at normal operating temperature, we see that the temperature gauge now reads correctly. We have now completed the repair of the temperature gauge by systematically using the six troubleshooting steps. Don't forget to reset the clock and the radio before returning the vehicle to the customer. If a flexible printed circuit board is cracked or shorted like this one, it will have to be replaced. The most important part of the removal and installation of the flex circuit is the installation of the bulbs back to their original positions. This is very important because of the different size and intensity of the bulbs. A bulb installed in the wrong location can cause other components to appear to be faulty. Now, to eliminate this problem, Mark the positions and color of the sockets on the side of the instrument cluster before you remove them. Here we are using a black felt tip marker for the gray sockets and a blue felt tip marker for the blue sockets. Then remove the bulbs. Remove the four screws in the center of the cluster and the three screws located in the upper right hand side. Notice that these screws are different from the rest of the screws in the cluster. Now remove the seven nuts located behind the gauges and disconnect the three flexible printed circuit board to cluster connectors. Notice how the connectors are folded so that you will be able to reinstall the new flexible printed circuit board the same way. Then remove the flexible printed circuit board. Make sure that your replacement circuit is the same revision as the one you took out. Now the revision is printed on the flexible printed circuit board. The circuit for example is revision B. To install the flex circuit, reverse the removal procedures. When reinstalling the bulbs, make sure that they are returned to their correct locations. Connecting the ignition off draw, or IOD, with the ignition in the on position will cause the clock to display an erroneous reading or no reading at all. If this happens, make sure that the key is in the off position and then disconnect the IOD connector. Wait approximately 30 seconds and reconnect the IOD connector, making sure that the key is still in the off position. If this still does not correct the problem, refer to the 1990 January Videotech entitled Premier Monaco Vehicle Maintenance Monitor, Trip Computer and Clock for complete clock diagnosis. In this session, we've covered a technical overview of how the Eagle Premier and Dodge Monaco instrument cluster works. We also touched on some of the serviceable parts available for the cluster. We ended with a sample problem, diagnosing the coolant temperature gauge that included the removal of the instrument cluster from the instrument panel. Everything that we have covered today is also covered in the service manual. So if you're not sure of something, be sure to look it up. We'll see you next month when we'll cover the in-car service of the ZF Transaxle.